everyone in the previous class we learnt about the strength criteria for isotropic and anisotropic rock we started with this topic with the comparison between soils and rocks we learnt about the stress strain relationship which is applicable for the linear elastic constitutive relation and then we also learned about the plane strain loading so today we will learn about the plane stress loading axisymmetric loading and then we will see what is the effect of confining pressure on the strength characteristics of rock and rock masses and then we will also learn about the mohr's failure theory so to start with plane stress loading this is not very common in the geotechnical applications in the previous class we saw that the plane strain loading which was quite applicable in areas related to geotechnical engineering for example uh, retaining walls strip loading etc an example of the plane stress loading include thin plate which is being loaded along its plane so like we discussed the stress strain relationship in case of the plane strain loading condition let us see how in case of plane stress loading these stresses and strains are being related take a note here that in this case of plane stress loading stresses are confined to xy plane while in case of the plane strain loading we have seen that strains were confined to xy plane the strain in z plane that was the perpendicular to xy plane was zero in case of plane strain loading however sigma z was non zero so here in this case this is related to stresses which are confined to xy plane so let us see how the stresses and strains are related in this plane stress loading case so i will first write the uh, strain vector which is epsilon x epsilon y and gamma xy so that's the strain vector this is equal to 1 upon e 1 minus nu 0 minus nu 1 0 0 0 2 1 plus nu and this will be multiplied by the stress vector which is sigma x sigma y and tau x y so this is how your strain vector is related to the stress ve vector now as we did in the previous case we can also do here like how to represent the stresses in terms of strains so again stresses are confined to the xy plane and i am going to write the same expression in terms of the stresses and strains so you see that the stress vector sigma x sigma y and tau xy which is the stress vector that is equal to e upon 1 minus nu whole square and 1 nu 0 nu 1 0 0 0 and 1 minus nu upon 2 this multiplied by epsilon x into epsilon y do gamma x y so this is your strain vector keep in mind that 
the stresses sigma x and sigma y these are the normal stresses tau xy is the shear stress while epsilon x and epsilon y these are norm normal strains and gamma xy is the shear strain e and nu these are the elastic modulus and poisson's ratio for the material again here the assumption is involved that the material is following the hooks law so dimension in the z direction is very small in case of the plane stress loading what was the situation in plane strain loading the dimension in the z direction was pretty long and therefore we could take the strain in that direction to be equal to zero now what are going to be the non zero stresses in case of the plane stress loading they are going to be sigma x sigma y and tau x y strains can be there perpendicular to x y plane so what all are the non zero strains in this case that's going to be epsilon x epsilon y epsilon z and gamma xy what does this mean is that all the three component of normal strains that is epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z are going to be non zero in case of the plane stress loading now what will happen uh, when you have the normal strain in the direction of zero normal stress because you can see from here that sigma z is zero in this case but in z direction epsilon z is non zero so what is the expression for this epsilon z so we will get epsilon z as nu upon 1 minus nu into epsilon x plus epsilon y or this can also be represented as minus nu upon e sigma x plus sigma y so this is how all the components of stresses and strains can be determined in case of the plane stress loading once again what is the difference between plane strain loading and plane stress loading say if xy is the plane of the consideration in case of the plane strain loading the strain in the z direction is going to be equal to 0 but it will have non zero stress in z direction however in case of the plane stress loading you will have non zero strain in the z direction but you will have zero stress in the z direction so you should be able to understand the difference between plane strain and plane stress loading in a very clear manner because this is very much important from geotechnical point of view so the next type of loading is the axisymmetric loading again this is very common in case of the geotechnical and the rock engineering an example include that along a vertical center line of a uniformly distributed load on the circular loading because it has the same lateral stress in all the direction this is what is called as the axisymmetric loading so you see it looks like this so you have a circular footing let us say and it is subjected to the uniformly distributed load and if this is being the axis so it is 
the uh, the lateral stress is same in all the directions so this problem is solved by this uh, axisymmetric loading now this sigma 1 and sigma 3 these are the axial and radial normal stresses uh, respectively uh, these are related to the corresponding normal strains epsilon 1 and epsilon 3. So, this epsilon 1 is the strain in which this axial stress is acting and epsilon 3 is the strain in the direction of sigma 3. So, let us see that how these are related to each other. So, in this case you have the two component epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 one is axial another one is radial that is given as 1 upon e 1 minus 2 nu minus nu 1 minus nu and multiplied by the stress vector this is sigma 1 and sigma 3 or this expression can also be written in the uh, other way uh, round that is sigma 1 sigma 3 this is equal to e upon 1 plus nu 1 minus 2 nu multiplied by 1 minus nu 2 nu nu and 1 and this should be multiplied by the strain vector which is comprising of the two components which is the axial and the radial normal strain. So, the strain in the elastic body they are caused by the displacement. So, there should be a relationship between strain and displacement and we should be aware of that. So, let us say that displacements in x, y and z directions they are respectively u, v and w. So, these x, y, z these three directions they are mutually perpendicular to each other. So, let us say this is your x, this is y and this is going to be z. So, these three are the mutually perpendicular direction. So, in x direction the deformation is u, y direction it is v and z direction it is small w. What is the relationship between displacements and strains? Let us see. Again, we will write it in the form of the matrix. So, uh, the, we have the strain vector as epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z. Then you have the shear strain gamma xy, gamma yz and gamma zx. So, this is our strain vector that is equal to a matrix which is del del x 0 0 0 del del y 0 0 0 del del z then del del y del del x and 0 then 0 del del z del del y then del del z 0 del del x. So, this matrix into multiplied by you will have the displacement vector which is u v and w. So, this is how this is your strain vector and this is your displacement vector. So, this is uh, what defines the relationship between displacement and strains. So, in case if the material is following the linear elasticity, then this is how one can obtain the stress strain relationship for different types of loading condition. It can be plane strain, plane stress, 
and axisymmetric loading. Now, we will learn about the effect of confining pressure on the strength characteristic of rock and after this we will learn about the Mohr's failure theory. So, most of the rocks they are significantly strengthened by confinement. In some of our earlier lectures when we were discussing the laboratory testing on rocks, we touched upon this particular aspect that when we were increasing the confinement, we were seeing the betterment in the strength characteristic of the rocks. What is the reason behind that? There are various theories. So, the one theory we are going to discuss now. So, this significant strengthening by the confinement is really very striking in a highly fissured rock. So, a highly fissured rock can be imagined as a mosaic of perfectly matching pieces like it has been shown in this figure. You can see that these are the planes of the discontinuity. In case of your fissured rock and these discontinuity planes they are matching perfectly with the next piece. So, let us say this is one piece, this is another piece. So, it is matching with this other piece in a very nice manner. Now, for this fissured rock to deform, what should happen? There should be the application of the energy or exertion of the energy which should be there in order to have the movement along any fracture plane. Now, that fracture plane can be anything. So, let us say for example that you have a average fracture plane say along this, okay, like this. Say for example, you can have any fracture plane along uh, any of the combination which is shown here in this figure. So, you see that a typical fracture plane has been shown here. So, this dotted line portion that is this portion is the orig original version and now you see when the load is applied, so sliding along the fissure is possible only if the rock is free to displace normal to the average surface of rupture. So, say this is the average surface of rupture, this one, this is the average surface of rupture. So, sliding will be possible only when this rock is free to displace normal to this plane. So, you can see here that some branches have been shown like this. So, these are typically showing the cracks which are taking place in the direction normal to the average surface of rupture. Now, under confinement what will happen? that the normal displacement which is required to move along such a jagged rupture path will require additional energy input. So, you see if, if this specimen has no confinement, what will happen? It will be easy for the rock to displace along that average rupture surface. But when you have the presence of the confining pressure, what will happen? Because of that confining pressure, it has to exert more energy to displace along that uh, jagged rupture path or the surface. Now, this is not uncommon for a fissured rock to achieve an increase in strength by about 10 times the amount of a small increment in mean stress. So, what do we mean by this? Let us say that you have initially 0 mean stress or the confinement. 
then we increase it to let us say sigma 3 1 then it has to exert some additional energy in order to have the displacement along the jagged rupture path now what i do is i further increase it to sigma 3 2 let us say so earlier it was 0 then it was sigma 3 1 and now it is say sigma 3 2 so the difference between this confining pressure which i have increased is this much now just by increasing the confinement confining pressure by this amount one can observe the increase in the strength as 10 times this difference that is 10 times sigma 3 2 minus sigma 3 1 this is so prominent that is the reason why rock bolts are quite effective in strengthening the tunnels especially in case of the weathered rock now another aspect that what happens when we increase the confining pressure or we are calling here as mean pressure have a look here there is a plot between epsilon axial and sigma 1 minus p p is being represented as the mean uh, pressure which is nothing but the confining pressure and you can see that the four plots are there they are corresponding to the mean pressure of p1 p2 p3 and p4 so the condition here is that p1 is less than p2 p2 is less than p3 and p3 is less than p4 in this case that means in this direction we are increasing the mean pressure now what is the observation take a look at these four plots when this mean pressure is small you can see that after the peak that means this location there is a sudden reduction in the stress strain plot then as you increase the mean pressure that is when you go to this p2 you can see that the slope of this post peak part it reduces and when you increase it further that is to p3 this slope gets even milder and a stage will come where you will have this type of situation where after the peak the branch does not come down but it goes like this here so with increase in the mean pressure there is a rapid decline in load carrying capacity after the peak load and this rapid decline becomes gradually less striking as we increase the mean pressure at the value of the mean pressure which is known as brittle to ductile transition pressure the rock behaves fully elastic this is a very important phenomena in case of the rock mechanics that means that the same rock can behave as brittle as well as ductile depending upon the value of the confining pressure at which the test on that specimen has been conducted now the question comes what can be the value of this transition pressure or at what value of the confining pressure the material will start behaving from brittle to ductile let us see that after the peak the continued deformation here in this case see here after the peak in all these three cases there is a sudden reduction 
and this is less striking when you are increasing the value of p but when the ductile behavior is there that is in this case so the continued deformation is going to take place so you see that this is after c that means c is the point kind of a peak and beyond this the continued deformation of the rock is possible without any reduction in the stress so if you just take more or less here the stress level is more or less constant and continuously you can see that the strain is increasing here it is epsilon axial and this is sigma 1 minus p so continuously strain is increasing without any reduction in stress now how should the failure mode will look like when we increase the confining pressure on the rock it is it going to be the same throughout or with increase in the confining pressure there is going to be uh, any change in that as well let us see this brittle to ductile transition that occurs at a pressure which are far beyond the region of interest in most of the civil engineering application however in some rocks like evaporate rocks or soft clay shales this plastic behavior can be seen at engineering service loads itself so i mentioned to you once again when you have the ductile kind of behavior after the peak you are going to get the continuous deformation without any reduction in stresses this brittle to ductile transition pressure in most of the rocks is beyond the engineering service uh, loads but in case of the uh, soft clay shales or evaporate rocks it can be seen at engineering service loads now without the confining pressure when we test the rocks most of the rocks they show one or more fractures parallel to the axis of loading take a look here you have more or less parallel to the plane of the loading you have these fracture planes when the ends are not smooth the rock will sometimes split in nearly two which is parallel to the axis like a brazilian specimen so in this case you see it will be something like this so it will be like the one piece and this is going to be the other piece in just in case if the ends are not smooth then you can get this type of situation now when you increase the confining pressure the failed specimen it demonstrates faulting with an inclined surface of rupture which is traversing the entire specimen take a look at the figure number b in this case so this means here there is the more confining pressure and you can see this kind of inclined surface of rupture which is traversing the entire specimen that is from this end of the specimen to this end of the specimen now in case of the soft rocks this phenomena may occur even with unconfined specimen that means when you have say sigma 3 equal to 0 in case of the soft rocks then also you can get this type of situation for too short a specimen continued deformation past the faulting region will drive the 
edges of the fault blocks into the testing machine platens thereby producing complex fracturing in these regions and possibly apparently we will get strain hardening kind of behavior what do we understand by the strain hardening kind of behavior that means if we have uh, the stress here and strain here then what we will get is this kind of behavior that means beyond this yield limit the resistance will be there in the uh, specimen like this so at the pressures above brittle to ductile transition there is not going to be any failure because the material is behaving in a ductile fashion but the deformed specimen is found to contain parallel inclined line which are the loci of intersection of the inclined rupture surfaces and the surfaces of the specimen that is the condition number c so you can see here that you are getting these two sets of inclined lines which are intersecting the surface of the specimen so one is in this direction and another one is in this direction which is kind of perpendicular to the earlier one so this is the situation that you will get at the pressures above brittle to ductile transition now the examination of the deformed rock will show intra crystalline twin gliding inter crystal slip and finally the rupture in such situation now mogi in 1965 he talked about this brittle to ductile transition pressure and suggested that when your sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is approximately equal to 3.4 times the confining pressure or sigma 3 then this condition this stress state will corresponds to the brittle to ductile transition later on when other researchers carried out the research in this direction they said that when you have sigma 1 in the range of 3 to 5 times sigma 3 then you can have the brittle to ductile transition now after getting the idea about the effect of confining pressure on rocks let us start our discussion on the first failure theory which is relevant to the material rocks let us see what is this failure theory because this was one of the earlier work that is being referred even today for the representation of the strength characteristic of the geo materials so in this case the assumption which is made is that the failure of a material is represented by a fundamental relationship between shear stress which is acting along the plane of failure and the normal stress acting across such plane and that relationship is given by tau is equal to f of sigma n that means what that let us say that you have a plane of failure then the shear stress along this plane this tau is a function of the normal stress along uh, normal stress on this plane that is sigma n now this normal stress whether it is compressive or whether it is tensile it contributes towards the failure it is not assumed in this theory that the material is equally strong in tension as well as in compression more only suggested 
that there is going to be a relationship between tau and sigma n however he did not he never said what kind of this relationship it is going to be whether it is going to be linear whether it is going to be non linear it was not mentioned so the only thing which was there is that the shear stress is a function of the normal stress on the plane of failure in this theory the effect of intermediate principal stress which is sigma 2 is ignored as per this theory it was suggested that the fundamental relationship between tau and sigma n is the characteristic of the material concerned and it must be determined by experimental tests so say we conduct the tests in the lab let us say that we conduct the triaxial test in the lab and then we try to plot the relationship between tau and sigma n and then we try to see what kind of relationship that experimental data is honoring so that is going to define this function f depending upon the characteristic of the material this function f can be linear or it can be parabolic it can be hyperbolic it can be anything it will be the characteristic of the material so mohr's failure theory in the most simple manner states that the shear stress at a failure plane is a function of the normal stress on that plane now this theory was further modified by mohr coulomb and you know the very well aware mohr coulomb failure criteria and you all know that it is a straight line so this we will discuss in the next class so to summarize what we discussed today we discussed about the stress strain relationship for the plane stress condition axisymmetric loading then we saw what is the effect of the confining pressure on the rocks how it is going to influence the failure pattern when you increase the value of sigma 3 or the confining pressure how the failure pattern in the rock specimen got changed and then we had the discussion on mohr's failure theory so in the next class we will start our discussion with mohr coulomb failure uh, theory thank you very much